This week on CrossFeed, Lazarus versus the zombies. Which roommate are you allowed? Excommunication over ads. Do churches contribute to suicide? And I'm not a witch. I have God on my side. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, everybody. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Evangelical Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. Good to be back. Yep, and happy. It's Okay, by the time you see this, it'll be at least All Saints Day, but we're recording this on, on Reformation Day, so happy Reformation Day, everybody, and happy Halloween, if you celebrate that. And if you don't, then enjoy your self-righteousness. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking about that today, that all the people that I know that, that don't celebrate it, and they get all self-righteous about it, like, oh, well, I'm a good Christian. It it's like, reminds me of the, was it last week, the Pharisee and the tax collector? Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like those people that go out and celebrate Halloween, you know? You're semi-evil. You're the margarine of evil. Well, I just had the rule with our kids that we didn't want any gory costumes. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Other things were okay, but my, my, my favorite today, and I've probably said it before, was my son dressing up as a mailbox and my daughter as a table. My That's two cool. older ones. Yeah, those, those are very creative costumes. They, mm -hmm. My kids always made theirs, I think. Uh, always just odds and ends around the house and came up with stuff. Yeah, yeah, we like to we like to go creative too. Um, my my favorite so far has been last year. One of them was a Wii remote, the controller. That was pretty cool. It's just a, a white sweatsuit, and we um, attach buttons to it, and uh, and put a like a black thing over the top, so over the hoodie, um, <clears throat> so it looked like the the little infrared um, thing. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, matter of fact, one year my my boys went out as uh, political campaigners, <laughs> and um, they had stolen signs. And on one side it said um, Bush Cheney, the other side Gore, whoever ran with him, and Lieberman. And uh, so that you know, are you a Republican or Democrat? And they say, No, I'm I'm going to vote for Gore. Okay. And they flipped their sign around. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, great. You know, uh, I mean, people got a big kick out of that. You know, you know which side your bread's buttered on, don't you? Whoever gives us the candy, man, we'll we'll, we'll support them. <laughs> so uh, that's but, great. Uh, now, everybody, I just uh, got back from uh, my vacation. I was down and uh, my niece's wedding, which was very nice, except it rained. The only time we had rain the entire vacation was during her wedding. Oh. <laughs> Which gives the reason not to have them outdoors. And um, then uh, after that, my wife and I, with my sister and my her husband and my cousin and her husband, took a cruise to the Bahamas for a few days. And so uh, that was just a very nice, relaxing time. So I'm feeling pretty good here, Mon. <laughs> so um, next week, I'll wear my shirt from the Bahamas, which has got to be seen to be believed. So give your reason to show back next week. <laughs> Well, I, we had our, our Reformation service this morning, um, which went pretty well. Um, it occurred to me that since we started using the PowerPoint, um, which so I use a lot of visuals in my sermons because of that. Um, I don't do like the, the bullet points and all that. I use pictures. And so today at the, my sermon, I, I had these visuals. And, and it occurred to me that since a lot of people listen to my sermons as podcasts or, or you can watch the stream and that, and the, the screen doesn't with our current technology, the, um, the screen doesn't really show it's not actually on the, the streaming, the video streaming. And, and it occurred to me that you really needed the visuals to get what my sermon was about. In fact, if you listen to my sermon, I never actually mentioned Jesus by name. I never mentioned God by name because the whole thing's a parable. And um and and so 
you know, people could listen to it, and and if they don't know what I'm talking about, like you kind of need to know the gospel pretty well to you know to to really get what the sermon's about. If you're there, like there's this part where I say, and and my brother showed up, and there's a picture of Jesus. Like, oh, okay, all right. When he says brother, that means Jesus, you know, um, and and father and stuff like that. And it just showed a picture of God the Father, you know, artist depiction, obviously. But um, well, of course, pictures of Jesus are artist depictions too. But um, but yeah, it just struck me that um, yeah, the it's pretty much just audio. Uh, hey, you know what? Speaking of Jesus and pictures, we have got to bring us to, of all people, Rob Liefeld. I think it's Liefeld. Liefeld. Ah, this is, all right. So okay, Jim, the E is after the I. If he was German, it'd be Liefeld. Okay, well, it's probably uh, Liefeld. But if the but if it was, he was German, you know, it'd be Liefeld. Okay. But anyway, so Rob uh, Liefeld, uh, Jim and I are both comic book fans. Oh, right. huge guy. Um, and, and and he's a huge name in comic books. Um, I'm or he person- was. Not so much anymore. Well, yeah, he kind of went off and did his own thing. But he invented cable, which I've never been a fan of. <laughs> Neither have I. have never been a fan of Deadpool either, but he invented yeah. He created that character. And- uh, he's probably best known for the huge triple muscular guys. I mean, they're this just really strange, exaggerated... Yeah. muscular built and he also he's the guy that really is responsible for the superhero costumes in the 90s all having pockets where they hmm. they had these like all these like belts and and like bandolier straps and stuff like that yeah, that had all right, these yeah. little pouches that was rob liefeld that that came up with that idea i hated it <laughs> Although, if you ever saw his early work, uh, particularly on Hawk and Dove, um, for uh, you could see he actually could draw. Uh, that was one I loved loved him on that book. But anyway, I did not realize that he is the son and the grandson of ordained ministers, and he him actually is a committed Christian, which really surprised me to find that out. I did not know that he did this. And it's not that. It's not that he's any of his work has been anti-Christian, per se. Um, you know, it's not like uh, Todd McFarlane with Spawn, you know, which is the you know Spawn referring to Hell Spawn, you know, and and he's this demonic character and it's the war between heaven and hell and all this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but which is actually the same time period when um, when Liefeld was was really big, but. Um, he created or or has a new comic coming out that is based on Matthew twenty seven, fifty one to fifty two. The earth shook, the rocks broke, and the tombs opened. Many men and women who had died came back to life again. They left the cemetery, went into the city, and appeared to many people there. Right. So here's his interpretation of that. The most disturbing scripture in the Bible revealed zombies walk the earth following the crucifixion of Christ. Now the 48 hours following Christ's death are revealed. After the crucifixion, supernatural warfare tore apart the Roman provinces. Zombie hordes attacked Jerusalem in search of the corpse of Christ. The disciples were under siege as the undead tore apart the countryside. And an unlikely hero, Lazarus the Immortal, emerged to combat the Legion of Dead. (laughs) I don't think that that's what happened <laughs> what is this guy crazy like, rob when you read your bible I, I you know you're looking for spiritual insights or you're looking good for good um plot premises <laughs> well i think he's really in here here in into plot premises here um i looked up the 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 the, the, the comic i mean okay he's having a little bit of fun here um mm-hmm. You know, and, and he is, you know, again, semi-serious. I mean, the serious you get in comic books. Um, <clears throat> he already had, he had another comic there based on his faith that looked pretty good. I can't remember what that one was. Evangeline. But then, what? Evangeline. Okay. Uh, then there was, um, the, uh, um, 
Ninja Jesus fighting Zeus. Well, that that was actually a if you if you looked at the whole there's a link to it in the article, um, where he yeah he takes on the whole uh, Greek pantheon, and yeah, and kicks their butt. But then if you if you kind of scroll down the page, they say, well, okay, here's the deal. This is all talking about um, how Jehovah cares for his for the humans and you know and, and all that kind of stuff and it kind of explains the whole thing that this happened on some sort of spiritual level and like you could kind of see it as the idea that he took on the um that he conquered death and hell and you know and and stuff like that like i mean obviously it's a stretch but jesus at least comes out on top Right. Well, I, what I thought was pretty actually kind of interesting about it is uh, because it can talk about how, how the Greek gods didn't really care about humanity, didn't care really about people. And this Jesus did. Um, and which is really, which is absolutely true. Uh, I've been uh, rereading a lot of Greek myths lately. And yeah, these people just, they really, I mean, they, they, the gods just really didn't care about the humans at all. Mm-hmm. You know, except for the fact that, you know, when, you know, they could find a, Human, human female to mate with. That was pretty cool, but you know, that was about it. Right. So anyway, back to, to, to Rob Liefeld here. Um, yeah, I think it looks like it, I get it. It might be an opportunity to be used, uh, to, you know, if you have an unchurched, uh, de-churched, uh, uh, comics fan out there to maybe, you know, engage them at least in a conversation. Right. Yeah. I mean, I do like the fact that. When he goes about these things, he talks about how God loves people, you know, right. and, and the, and he refers to him also as like the true God, um, you know, and things like that. So, you know, what he's doing is he's, he's sort of taking these ideas and, and, um, and, and writing these kind of goofy stories, but in it, he's working in concepts about God, you know, sort of planting ideas and stuff like that i you know at, on the one hand some people are going to look at it and they're going to say ah that's that's really um irreverent and and stuff like that you know on the other hand though he's he's taking a genre and um and and sort of he's he's sort of playing with the genre and and it sort of comes across as a bit of a parable or you know or something like that and um well not really a parable cuz if you sort of see a parable as the sort of classic definition of an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, uh, it's not an earthly story, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, a horror movie with a heavenly meaning, <laughs> but that's a new view of a uh, uh, parable there. I got to remember that one. Oh my goodness. Hey, but at least there's nothing illegal about having a, kind of Christian comic book, just so long as not looking for a Christian roommate, too. Yeah. Well, this article floored me. I couldn't believe this. So, this is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. A woman put up an advertisement at her church. In Ju- This happened in last July, seeking a Christian roommate. And now she is um, she's facing a civil rights complaint that's been filed against her Um, because she could face several hundred dollars in fines and fair housing training. So it doesn't happen again. The um, fair housing act, this uh, Michigan department of civil rights, fair housing act prevents people from publishing an advertisement stating their preference of religion, race, or handicap with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling. Right now she's looking for a roommate. No, I, I guess if if she lives in the house and she's looking for somebody to to share the house with her that way, and I guess it doesn't say um, whether she already rents there or if or whether she owns the place and is just looking for someone to come in and and rent from her. Go home. Go. But you know so. So here's the question. Is it fair to discriminate against, um, you know, based on religion? Or is this even discrimination? Right? You know, 
if you're looking for, say you're on like eHarmony or something like that, looking for a date, a potential spouse or domestic partner or whatever you're looking for, okay? So aren't you going to look for somebody, if you're going to share a, you know, a home with somebody, aren't you going to look for somebody that you have something in common with? Right? So, you know, in this case, she's looking for a roommate, not a, a serious relationship. But at the same time, shouldn't you be able to say, you know what? I'm looking for somebody that I can, you know, that I can have this really important thing in common with. I look at you and I, I'm home. And I just, I don't see, I, I think this should really go to the Supreme Court. And, and be challenged because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's a if a it's an interesting situation, particularly if it is a roommate. I mean, particularly if you have to uh, stay within the same, um, you know, the same ap- apartment. I'm not sure how much. Um, room that you have i mean um you know uh, uh um you know of course the, here's the question uh um you know how do you define the difference between roommate and owner occupied apartment building with a common living area so i mean i'm gonna just throw out a couple of things. see i don't we don't there's so much about this i don't know that i that I would help me if we did mm-hmm. um in making a decision like this um I mean, um, how much, you know, how, how much common area is there? Is there a separate lock on each door? So my daughter, when she was down in, uh, uh, Georgia for a while was renting and is, it's an interesting apartment building. I've never seen one like this where it's geared for roommates. Um, the, you know, there's two, three bedroom apartments, but each bedroom has a, has a, has a separate lock. So you have a lock to the apartment and then you have a common kitchen and living room. But then each of the bedroom has separate lock, has a separate lock. Hmm. So that you can, you know, keep the other people, other apartment dwellers out of your personal stuff. Um, you know, it would, you know, would it be kind of that type of thing? I mean, how, how far can you discriminate or not discriminate in a situation like this? Right. Yeah. Because, uh-huh. you know, what it comes down to is you have discrimination either way, right? If you're telling a person you have to live with somebody that, um, you know, that, that whose beliefs are, are directly opposed to yours, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I want to, I, I, I'm a, a Muslim and I don't believe in, um, in depictions of, of God or, you know, whatever, so you, or, or of the prophets. So you're going to have to take that picture of Jesus off the wall. Well, the question is not, I think, discrimination either way. I mean, no matter what you do, you're going to discriminate. Because unless they say, whoever answers the ad first, you must choose that person. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, because otherwise you're going to have five or six people call you. You're going to sit down with them. You're going to talk to them. You're going to maybe get credit references to make sure they can actually pay the rent. Mm-hmm. You know, make sure this person is not a bum who's going to, you know, ruin the, the, the apartment and you get stuck having to pay for it. I mean, there's going to be certain things you're going to be checking out. Right. But you're not allowed uh, to ask them what their religious beliefs are. You know, I mean, and again, to a certain extent, how, how much difference is that, necess- you know, is necessarily going to make? Um, I mean, okay, so, uh, you, you know, you had the, 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 you know, the idea of this Muslim who gets all, you know, gets offended. What about somebody just, I really don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm not religious. Um, you are, that's fine. Go ahead and be, I, that doesn't bother me at all. Mm-hmm. Let me well, sleep on Sunday morning. You go do your thing. At the same time, all right, what if the, um, you know, well, at least then I suppose you could come up with rules as far as, you know, having, uh, you, um, having guests over, <laughs> you know, and. In other words, uh, does the roommate want to sleep with their boyfriend? 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's the question you ask. Right. And that's going to be an, an issue that would come up. I mean, you know, you see, that's the problem is that, you know, you, you have an issue, no matter what you do, you have to make a choice. And choice by definition includes discrimination because that means there's certain things I choose and certain things I do not choose. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's just reality. I think the thing that floored me even more about this is the fact that she posted this at church and someone from the church turned her in. And I'm just thinking, who would do that? <laughs> Who says she necessarily turned her in? I mean, it, it could be just simply somebody saw it and mentioned it to somebody at work. Yeah, a girl in my church is looking for a Christian roommate. And somebody else turned it in then. Yeah, we don't know who turned it in. We don't know if it turned in from, uh, um, you know. Now, my other question is, though, and here, here's, you know, there's a freedom of religion and there's also a freedom of association. Right. And how far can you go on a freedom of association on, on something like this? Um, you know, at the same time, OK, I mean, what if, you know, it said white roommate wanted. Mm -hmm. Right. Although, you know, the. I think you and I would vote to say, well, that really doesn't make it, it shouldn't make a difference because, you know, skin color is one thing. Faith is something else. Right. Because faith's going to add into morality. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, uh, and I think we both be, you know, completely against the idea of a, uh, um, a, uh, race based idea of mm -hmm. discrimination. But, uh, you know, you know when you when you talk about people's faith and you talk about their deepest values, uh, you know. But on the other hand, it, what it could, is it possibly to be non-religious yet moral? Well, yeah, absolutely. All right. And but, I mean, then you know, could I could put up with a moral? Maybe that's what she wants. Maybe she wants a moral roommate. At the same time, look here. Let's just take the the Muslim idea again. All right. So so the Muslim moves in. And um and puts up a bunch of um Muslim artwork or you know or, or whatever, and she went, "This is my house. I don't want that stuff in my house." You know, even if it's just in the bedroom, it's still this is in my house. You know, and depending who you are, I mean, with some Christians are very big into the sort sort of spiritual warfare kind of stuff, and they're going to see that as inviting demons in. All right. Now, I'm not saying that I agree that, you know, putting a picture up on the wall is going to invite demons in, but some Christians do. And so if this person happens to be like that, they're going to have a problem on, you know, on religious grounds. They're going to be terrified of of having somebody, you know, that would potentially be a, a strong believer in another faith, um, you know, to be there. There is evil there that does not sleep. Well, I don't know. If I I, I think the Fair Housing Center there in West Michigan should dismiss the dismiss it and be done with it, because um, I don't think she's doing anything any great violence to anybody. Um, <clears throat> I care less. I don't want to be a roommate, but uh, you know, you, you, I think you do have to. You know, there, there's there's some lines that need to be drawn. Uh, is this an air a line where you draw it or not? Maybe our listeners have a different viewpoint. So if any of our listeners uh, have a perspective on, on the rightness or wrongness of this little situation, please let us know. We'd be very interested in your opinion yeah. at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, it says the person who filed the initial complaint saw the ad on the church bulletin board and contacted the local fair housing organization. So, yeah, it was somebody at church that saw it and complained. <laughs> Which is interesting that, that they didn't even talk to her. Yeah. You know, you know so, I mean. <laughs> so, which goes to show that just because the person's Christian doesn't mean it's necessarily somebody that you want as your roommate. <laughs> no, that's right. Or, I don't know, maybe they did. Maybe they said, no, you know, you know, it's a discriminatory statement. It's illegal to make that. Well, I don't really care. Who knows? Could be. Um, but at least she didn't make, a mo make an advertisement. Okay, now Dale picks these stories, and Dale emails to me the choices. 
<laughs> so let's just make it clear that you cannot blame me for this story. Or you cannot praise me if you like it. So I'm going to let Dale do on this discussion. <laughs> All right. All right. This one was in the New York Post. All right. It's a, uh, an erectile dysfunction commercial in Australia. Um, <laughs> and, and the, the article, now, there goes our so there goes our clean rating yeah. on, on on iTunes. Right here, 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 yeah, folks. Here we never goes. had one. Okay, so. <laughs> well, to, one. <laughs> it's a, I'm sorry, but it's a funny ad. <laughs> right. So his funny is mine really tacky. So it's just, really just tacky, clear. but it's funny. All right. So this woman's trying to get cookies off of a high shelf. She calls her husband to um to help her out. He walks in in his robe, opens up his robe. I mean, you, you don't get, you can't see anything, but she goes, "Oh wow!" You know, she kind of looks down and, "Oh wow!" And then <laughs> she uses him as a step to get up to get her cookies. All right, so yeah, it's horribly tacky. All right, but. This isn't about the ad. This is about the fact that she's been excommunicated from her church for doing this ad and will not be reinstated until the ad comes off the air. Right. Now, now this is what I'm not. Yeah, I say I can't. That doesn't make she, She's been disfellowshipped or excommunicated or something. But once I guess they're done with the ad, they take it off the air, she'll be brought back in. I mean, okay, if she did something that's wrong, worthy of excommunication, then she needs to repent. If it's not, you know, and we just think this is a very tacky ad, and once it's off the air, we'll let you back in, that doesn't make any sense to me. No, all right? This should be about, okay, first of all, you need to determine whether this is sinful. Personally, I think it's tacky, but I don't know that I'd call it sinful. She's calling her husband. All right. I mean, it's it's pretty clear, or what I got from it anyway. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's it, it's her husband, um, in in the ad. Okay. So yes, the rest of it is is really tacky, but it's not. I mean, unless you want to, I guess you could chalk it up to, um, 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 um sort of making light of of sexuality in a sense that um and paul uh speaks about that and you know and says don't be crude and and that i forget the exact wording um so yeah it, it's crude so but and you know she says um she knew that when she was filming it that it was in poor taste but she needed the money she said my visa was calling out for mercy Right. So, you know, I needed the money isn't a good reason to do it. Um, but at the same time, she, she, you know, she said, look, you know, I, yeah, I, I shouldn't have done it. Sorry. You know, um, felt bad about it. Felt like I needed to, whatever. And, you know, so then you say, you know, but she kind of said that, she said, yeah. I, 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 I'm a, I'm a single mom. I need the money. Yeah, you know, I gotta, I gotta have money to take care of my kids. So I need the money. So, so she um, said it was against my better judgment. I don't like to offend people, you know. <laughs> right. So she's confessed her sin publicly. Right. She says I, I shouldn't have done it. All right. So then you, the church's job is not to say, well, let us know when it goes off the air, and we'll talk about forgiveness. The church's job is to say, you know what, Jesus died for that sin too, and you're forgiven. You know, the big sins, the little sins, the the goofy sins, you know, it's forgiven. So what it has to do with it being on the air? I don't know. It's just, I mean, of all the things to, um, to disfellowship somebody over, she did a goofy TV ad. Yeah, but could you imagine the conversation in, in your congregation if one of your members had done an ad like that one? Yeah, well, she'd have to deal with it, you know. 
and and people will be talking about it and stuff and it would probably be something to the point that um that it would need to be sort of publicly addressed otherwise it would just end up being an elephant in the room all right so you address it she stands up and says hey everybody sorry you know and then we say well we forgive you we still love you jesus loves you you know so and next time before you do an ad like that um if you're if things are really that tight for you, talk to us and we'll see if we can help you out somehow. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I probably got pretty good money for making the ad, so probably. So. But maybe, maybe you know, God was on her side. There you go. Maybe she was she, called. She, 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 no, you know, she should have started off and looked at the guy. Said, you know, I'm not a witch. <laughs> I'm you. <laughs> we are talking, of course, about none other than Christine O'Donnell, the um, slightly goofy um, Republican Senate candidate out of Delaware um, who just kind of take, took the nation by storm, uh, who, you know, back when she was, um, you know, younger, made... Was was on MTV and a lot of other stuff a lot, and just made some rather goofy statements that have kind of come back to haunt her ever since. So here's my question: because I'd never heard of her before, she was made the news as this sort of Tea Party first Tea Party person to get a nomination, right? I wish she wasn't the first; she was just you know. Well, but what but, was she doing on all those shows before that? Do you? I mean, do you have any idea? Offering commentary from a, a millennial perspective. And, uh, you know, and, you know, and she just was there, you know, and, and who knows. But, um, uh, you know, what she did was, though, defeated a guy who was so popular in Delaware that, you know, Joe Biden's son bypassed the election because he was, for, you know, he, he was afraid he was going to lose to him, lose to him. Um and uh, who's now kicking himself? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, the family seat's going to some guy that he thought was going to get crushed in the election. So, um, but uh, so she she's a little bit interesting, anyhow. So she sat down with the Christian Network and um, said, "God is the reason I'm running." If I didn't believe there was a cause greater than myself worth fighting for, if I didn't believe it takes a complete dying to self to make things right in this election cycle, I would not be running. When you die to yourself, you rely on a power greater than yourself. Prayer is what's gotten us through. And um, yeah, then she said she always asks, please pray for the campaign, pay for the staff, pay that the voters, the, uh, the eyes of the voters will be opened. In other words, that they would see that they should vote for me. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 she said that uh, um, you know uh, She said uh, she uh, increased in the polls after there was a, a prayer meeting for her. So she chalks um, that up to the prayer meeting. So um, now she said um, yeah, yeah, but she says uh, 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 um you know, that God will create those desires in you so you have a passion to do what he is calling you to do. Yeah, she's quoting so, Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself, uh, little King James there, um, also in the Lord that he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And and she says, you know, that's not about, um, it, it, it's not about, you know, whatever I desire God's going to give me, but rather... Um, that asking God, what should I desire so that my will is, you know, conformed with God's will. All right. And that's good. That's, you know, she's right about that, that if asking God, what should I pray for is actually, you know, that's a great place to start. Okay. The fact that she wants to run, does that mean that God has, has led her to run? Here's the problem with, with this is that, 
what if she loses? And she says, God wants me, you know, then, then it means, well, God lost. And, and I guess I have trouble with a God endorsed candidate. I know she says, you know, God, you gave me this desire. You gave me this desire of my heart to serve the people of Delaware, to go in there and be your voice in Congress. Um, and so to a certain extent, it's like, yeah, the only reason I'm running is because God put this desire in my heart. You know, I was just walking down the street and I didn't know what I was doing. And all of a sudden, God put this desire in my heart. The next thing I know, I'm running for president. I'm running for senator. Um, and uh, so... Uh, uh, and then also, I like the fact that she said, um, uh, what was it, um, that had she known she was running for, um, yeah, if she'd known politics for her future, she wouldn't have appeared on shows like Politically Incorrect in the 90s and added all the statements that are now haunting her attempt to become a senator. Mm-hmm. Although, how could she not know that politics was in her future? I think this is the third time she's run for senator. <laughs> You know, um, so maybe she didn't know that she was actually going to get this far. So I don't know. I, I I'm nervous about when politicians say God's endorsing me. Um, you you know, you could say God wants me to run. <laughs> Yeah. Run, Forrest, run! <laughs> so, you know, you could say that, you know, that that I believe, or you could say that, that I believe that God is leading me to run for this position, all right? You can't say I believe that God wants me to win. Right. Well, it goes back, you know, to what we talk about, you know, and maybe this is kind of an odd analogy, but we talk about what we talk about ministry in the inner call and the you know the immediate call that you know you may feel called to ministry. That does not mean that God you know it's just not until you have a call from the church that you're actually called into the ministry. Right. Yeah. So they had the old joke about the guy who comes to seminary and he says, uh, "Yeah, he says I I know this is what God wants me to do. I was I was out there one day in the farm and I was out there plowing and working in the the field, you know, with the corn and stuff and." Um, looked up in this cloud, and clouds, and I saw this giant PC in the clouds. I knew it said, preach Christ. And I knew that's what God wanted me to do. And so they said, well, okay, let's see what you do. And he couldn't do the languages, couldn't do anything. And they said, you know, you really should think about this. No, 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 no. I saw it. There's a giant PC in the clouds. I was out there one day plowing and I saw a PC. I knew that meant preach Christ. I know that's what God wants me to do here. And. So he tries again and still can't do it. And they bring him back in and say, are you sure about this? Yes, yes, I was out there one day I'm working on the farm. I saw the great PC in the clouds. I knew that meant preach Christ. And Alex Smith says, sure that PC didn't stand for plow corn. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's a matter of interpreting, it, you know. And, and so what it comes down to is, I guess, we'll know. You know, we'll find out um, in a few days. Um, hey, if she wins, it would be one of the biggest upsets in the entire country. And based on polls, seems pretty unlikely at this point. So, I, at least last I That's heard. true, but on the other hand, um, you know, there's, 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 the only poll that really counts is who shows up on election day. Well, yeah, that's absolutely true. And there have been plenty Man. of times where the polls predicted things one way by a landslide and it turned out the other way. So, uh, Most famously, uh, when Pataki was uh, elected governor of New York, and the poll showed him down 13 points the day before. Hmm. But he came out edging the other guy by two or three. So who knows? It all depends on who shows up and how they show up and all kinds of fun things like that. Uh, but, uh, so... Right. Which speaking well, of surveys, have, you know, you know okay. she'd be a fun person to have just just to watch the media go crazy and you know for the next six years with her in the office. She's given Jay Leno plenty plenty of material. <laughs> well, again, you know, I mean, it's it's one of these things where these guys pick their narrative, and she's a ditz, mm-hmm. and so they you know focus on anything that you know so it's you know. 
Uh, George George Bush was an idiot, you know, was an idiot with my pet goat. Dan Quayle couldn't spell, you know. Yeah. You know, Barack well, Obama says there's 57 states, um, you know, and uh, a couple other, you know, and and Joe Biden, you know, says it's all about a three letter word, J O B S, um, you know. But those guys aren't aren't stupid, you know. I mean, they you know those are just you know they're tired. So you you can make you can make you know. We forget, of course, that Joe Biden stole were whole speeches um, and gave them, and we had to drop out of being for presidential run for being uh, uh, an out out now plagiarist. Um, but you know, I remember my students; he would have failed. Um, <laughs> we won't go there. Let's move on. All right. Speaking of surveys, and it's time now for our weekly gay story. <laughs> if we got the weekly gay and Mormon story. Yeah. <laughs> so we killed two birds with one stone this week. We're making our quota here, folks. Oh, man. Okay. So th- this one, it, it really showed It's survey links gay suicides to religious messages. Nearly two thirds of Americans believe that messages from U.S. religious pulpits are connected to the rising rates of suicide among gay youths, according to a new poll. All right. Oh, and and the other important part of this article is um, survey includes breakouts of some faith traditions, but too few Mormons took part to draw conclusions about how members of Utah's predominant faith regard their own leader's handling of the homosexuality issue. All right. Then the whole rest of the article goes on to talk about Mormons, even though there were not enough Mormons on here to count. Right. Right. Because it's in the Salt Lake Tribune. (laughs) Of course. Now, okay. Now, what what happened was, um, um, you know, they they did this thing. You know, it was prompted by a rash of teen suicides. Now, I'm not exactly even sure how many gay suicides there have been. Um, it would be interesting to see the numbers compared to straight suicides, you know, per capita. Because right. I mean, it, it's the, sort of the, like the, a few some... years ago when there was like shark attacks were all in the news. And um and like oh all these shark attacks and then somebody started looking at the at the actual statistics and they said actually shark attacks this year are down it's just that for some reason the media is is reporting every single one right so that would be interesting anyhow it's interesting because it's talked about you know when was the what's the best known one it happened at a secular college. When this guy's roommate, you know, live streams him meeting up with another gay guy, you know, and posts it on the internet. Right. And absolutely the guy who did the religion. posting was not Christian. The college was not Christian. It had nothing to do with religion at all. Mm-hmm. Right. But you have stuff like when Matthew Shepard was killed. Katie Couric blamed Jim Dobson and any other church or parachurch organization or pastor that um, that preaches homosexuality is sin. Yes, because we know that the two guys who, you know, he met up with in the bar were both committed Christians that prayed before they killed him. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's just get it right. Let's just get it right because, you know, two guys who, you know, have already had already beaten up a bunch of straight people that night. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we're just, you know, right. one but, doesn't. I mean, the thing is, one does not have anything to do with the other. And I think any Christian group condemns, you know, uh, um, any kind of. Um, bullying or unkindness towards anyone. Right. You know, I mean, you have gay friends. I have gay friends. You know, oh, you know, I, I was bullied as a kid. Mm-hmm. I was small. I was, you know, I remember being picked up and thrown into a locker and the door being shut behind me in junior high. I mean, it was it was really weird when I went to uh, started going down to Concordia, Missouri, to St. Paul's College High School, and guys would walk by me and they wondered why I flinched. I said, because where I came from school, guys would walk by me and punch me in the stomach on the way. Oh, nerds! Yeah, you know, 
Yeah, I got but, plenty of stories about that too. I wasn't gay. <laughs> you know, don't have but to be yeah, gay I mean that's just it. I mean, you know, I was a late bloomer. Um, you know, there's all the stuff that was about me in those days. You know, bullying is a reality that has been going on for a long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is the case with the uh, Facebook bullying and the girl committed suicide. Yep. She wasn't gay. She was just bullied. I mean, it's it, I don't know if homosexuality is the issue here as much as just sheer bullying and right. bullying is always wrong. Yeah. And, and bullies will pick any excuse they can find. It's not that, you know. Like, will they will they target you more if you're gay? Yeah, because it's easy. It's not so much like it's discrimination or anything like that. It's just easy if you if you know somebody's gay. Oh, that's an easy thing to easy excuse to bully, you know. But if you can't find any of that, you'll find somebody else instead. All right. So yeah, it is tougher in certain environments. Um, at the same time, oh, in other come environments, on. It's, you're it's, celebrated. It's, it's, Homosexuality doesn't have anything. I don't think it's easier if you're smaller, if you're um, uh, 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 smart, a late bloomer. If you're smart, if you are um, poor uh, or rich, overweight. If you are not, a, if you are what people would consider unattractive. Um, I remember kids being bullied and picked on, and and and. Uh, Stories being told about them, you know, and, and to this day, I couldn't tell you if any of them, any of them were gate or stray, gate or stray, <laughs> stray or gate, stray or gate, gay or straight. Finally, get it right. Okay, there's the title there. Okay, you know, you know, uh, 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 straight or uh, uh, stray or gate. There's your title for the week, right yes. there. Um, but um, you know, none of that mattered. None of us knew it, but the kids were picked on and bullied all the same. Mm-hmm. You no, know, the thing is, there's another part of this article though, and and that's just what I said. Nearly two thirds of Americans believe that messages from U.S. religious pulpits are connected to the rising rates of suicide. All right, but then you got to look at the actual results of the survey. All right, so <clears throat> first question was. Messages about the issue of homosexuality coming from places of worship contribute a lot, a little, or not at all to negative views of gay and lesbian people. All right, forty percent said a lot, thirty-two percent said a little, and seventeen uh, percent said not at all. Eleven percent said don't know. All right, so another way you could put that is sixty percent of people think that. Um, that religious messages are, are little or not at all affecting um, people's views. All right? It all depends on how you group them together. And, and frankly, when I saw this and I, thought, I saw 40%, I thought, wow, that's a really low number. But they lumped it in with the a little ones. Oh, well, then it's 72%. Well, yeah, but, I mean, a little? Well, sure. I mean, I was surprised that I would think everybody would say a little, because there's okay, always. Where, where did you read this? That that was on the second page, or it was. You know, I didn't see it in the article in, until I brought up the print edition, the print version of it. Mm. Uh, and then it showed up for some reason. So I'm not sure what the deal was there. Maybe it was covered up by an ad in the first part or something. I don't know, but yeah, I can't seem to find it. Yeah, let me see if I bring it up here so if I can find that. Sorry about the mess. And then it says messages about the issues of homosexuality coming from places of worship contribute a lot, a little, or not at all to higher rates of suicide among gay and lesbian youth. All right? 33% said a lot. All right? That means that 67% because and 32% said a little. 21% said not at all, and 40% said don't know. Which means that two-thirds of people believe that there's little or no effect on the suicide rates based on religious messages. Okay? The other part about this is, this is not a, um, this is not a question of whether it actually does have an impact. 
This is a survey of whether people believe that it has an impact. In other words, how influenced are people by the media? Right. That's what this is really a survey of. This has nothing to do with reality. Right. Especially because it's very interesting that, um, uh, uh, um, you know, they said, uh, um, let's see, uh, four in ten correspondents gave religious organizations a D or an F for, uh, uh, for how they handle it. But many rate their own places of worship more favorably to the issue with, um, 28% giving them an A and 17% a B, which added together. Interesting enough, they didn't want to add those two numbers together. You know, mm-hmm. that is what 42% of the people or 45%, I'm sorry, 45% see that uh, 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 their own places are favorable and white evangelicals uh, are even a higher number yet. Um, who, who, uh, 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 in, among white evangelicals, 75% give their own church an A or a B. Um, Catholics are the most likely to hand their church low grades a third giving them a D or F, but even then they're saying two-thirds are saying they do an A, B, or C job. So, you know, they say, oh, you know, again, you know, what, what number are you emphasizing? Right, right. This is a just a classic example of media spin. You know, not only are they spinning the results, the survey itself is spin. The, the actual questions that were asked. All it is is about people's perceptions. But it's not being presented that way. So... I, I mean, you know, are, do do certain religious groups are they going to cause people to have a negative view of of homosexuals? Yeah, all right. And we've spoken we've spoken against those groups here. Not only the really radical ones like you know Fred Phelps's church, um, but but others. Any church that that talks about homosexuality being worse than say cohabitation or divorce or you know stuff like that or pornography or, or anything like that. I mean, sexual sin is sexual sin, right? And people that struggle with sexual sin need help. They need, um, you know, they need Jesus, no matter what that particular sin is, you know, <laughs> whether it's, whether it's somebody who's, um, who, who's oriented toward uh, homosexuality or somebody that does a um, a goofy medication commercial. <laughs> you know? All right? They all need Jesus. And and that's the whole thing. That's, that's the thing that the media doesn't get or maybe is deliberately avoiding. I don't know. I, you know, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they just don't understand. All right? That, okay, we, yeah, we talk about what... Uh, the Bible says is sin, but we also talk about God's forgiveness, and we talk about you know that Jesus still loves you, and you know I mean you look at the people that Jesus hung out with, you know prostitutes among others. He didn't affirm that, right? Yeah, you know, but as um, Phil Yancey famously once said. You know, the very people that Jesus hung out with would be, you know, how welcome would they, they be in our churches today? Mm-hmm. You know, and we've struggled with that. You know, people, you know, uh, we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with being that Pharisee who said, says, you know, thank God I'm not like other people. Uh, we all struggle with self-righteousness. That really is a reality. Um, it's, you know, always remembering that it's all by grace for all of us. And, you know, <laughs> as Max Lucado once said, you know, sometimes we go back to God and we say, God, I don't deserve to be forgiven again. To which God replies, that's okay. You didn't deserve to be the forgiven the first time. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, you know, and that, and that's the whole thing that, that it comes down to is that you can't deserve to be forgiven. It's an oxymoron. Right. 
So if you need no. forgiveness, then you don't deserve it. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you know, and uh, right, and yeah, and that's just it. I mean, you know, and that's what Luther reminded us of that. You know, it's it's purely on this wonderful Reformation Day. You talked about Halloween. It's also Reformation Day. That that it's the pure grace of God. It is by grace that we stand, and only grace. Mm-hmm. And if it is in any way deserved or earned, it's not grace anymore. Right. I mean, it's the definition of grace is undeserved love. Right. Undeserved love. Or as I like to phrase it because of my issues of self-acceptance, God's unconditional acceptance of us. That he accepts us just as we are, unconditionally. Uh, and I've shared that with high school kids. And, and I, it's huge. Because the idea that they are completely accepted, uh, because nobody else accepts them. Everybody else is looking for them to dress a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain height or have a certain degree or something. And as I told a friend of mine, who a gay friend of mine, said, you don't have to get straightened out for God to love you. God right. loves you anyway. He right. accepts you as you are. But if you accept him as your savior and believe in him, he will change you from the inside out. You know, and you have to be asking yourself, am you're willing, are you willing to lay your life in the line for Jesus? And, um, you know, accept the fact that he will be making you into a different person. And that's the hard thing. That's the thing that I think that the world has the toughest time with. You know, because, like, don't ever advertise something as life-changing. Because most people in the United States are pretty happy with their lives just the way they are. It's like, yeah, see, if I believe this, then I have to change the way I live, <laughs> All right? And I'm pretty comfortable with the way I live, so I'll just stick with the status quo. All right. Well, what is it Paul says at the end of Acts, quotes Isaiah, you will ever be hearing but never understanding, ever seeing but never perceiving. Otherwise, these people would see their sin, it would turn from their sin, and I would forgive them, says the Lord. Yeah, that's it. People, you know, they, you know, but it, but it's not that there are many who are Christian or many who are called. It's few. Those who hit that point in their lives, and like Augustine and like Luther, and who say, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> There's an emptiness in life. There's an emptiness that, the, that they, they've tried everything else that only God can fill. And they realize that grace. And it is life-changing for them. Because they know they need a life change. Yeah. Did, did I ever tell you about the... Um, uh, I mean, with it, it would be within the past week or two. Um, the, the comment in my confirmation class about um, how does Jesus feel about the way God feels about us? Mm-hmm. It was, she, she goes, okay. Because I was, I was talking about uh, how... Um, because of what Jesus has done for us, God looks at us and sees Jesus' righteousness. And um, and one of the kids in my confirmation class said, isn't that kind of a slap in the face to Jesus? That he does all the good and everything, and then God looks at us and says, well done. And he gets, you know, he gets crucified for it. And, and here, and, you know, God gives us the credit. Wouldn't, you know... Isn't that just totally just God slamming Jesus? And, and, you know, it's sort of like, why is Jesus putting up with that? You know, it's like, you get it. (laughs) And it it was, it was such a cool question because it was like, exactly. While we were still, while we were still sinners, God loved us. And died for us. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Unlooked for, unasked for, unwanted. He did it anyway. Yeah. So, seriously, think by listening, and you're struggling and wondering, how does God think about me? How does God feel about me? Look at the cross. Look right, right behind my shoulder. You can see it right, right back there. And there's your answer. He gave his son on the cross for you. That's how much he loves you. And if you were the only person in the entire history of the world that would believe in him, 
Jesus would have come and suffered it all anyway. Right. Yeah. No matter who you are, no matter whether you find people of the same sex attractive, whether you are Democrat or Republican or Tea Party or Coffee Party or Independent or, you know, take your pick, um, whether you are uh, a Rob Liefeld fan or a Todd McFarlane fan or don't like comic books at all, you know, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you're going to do in the future, no matter what you are involved in right now, no matter what your addictions are, no matter what your living situation is, God loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. Yeah, it's it's huge. And, you know, I, I, I said today, because we're, we're doing a, um, in, in two weeks we're doing a service of prayer for the persecuted church. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to have, uh, uh, actually a couple of guest speakers that have firsthand experience. Uh, one's going to be a actually recorded interview. Um, and the other one's going to be a live speaker. And, um, and I, I said, you know, we keep hearing homophobic, homophobic, um, to be refer to anybody who believes homosexuality is a sin. All right. And you can debate about whether fear has anything to do with that for some people. I, I'm sure it does, but, um, but for many people it doesn't, it's not very, a very accurate term. All right. But we live in a Christophobic world. Our world is afraid of Jesus. They're afraid that he could transform our society, that he could transform individuals so that they start living in, um, for him, that they start going around, um, serving other people, forgiving other people and say, why would people be against that? All right. For the same reason that, that you don't like the people in your workplace that work really, really hard because they make you look bad. Ah, don't do that. Right. And all those other kinds of reasons too. Right. But we live in a Christophobic world. So, <clears throat> but at the same time, Jesus died for people that are afraid of him too. True. Well, on what we hope was a very gracious note, um, we're going to end tonight's um, podcast and truly hope you've enjoyed it and that it encouraged you in your your your, your growth in God and in your relationship with him. Uh, thank you, as always, for, for tuning in and listening. Um, you are what make us worth doing this job. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, and good night. Uh, have a blessed uh, post-Reformation week, post-All Saints week, um, and, uh, and God bless. 